Hi folks, my name is Gary Spally, the host for Back to Basics, another Back to Basics for another week. Today we're going to be talking about technology innovation, blockchain, Web3, new things, old things, should we learn it, should we not learn it? Those are the words that we'll be using today. And why is it so needed for a blockchain and Web3? And we'll talk about that today, later today, on, on a show with uh, Prashant. And Prashant is an awesome guy. I just spoke with him a couple of weeks back. He has tons and tons of knowledge. Now the main question is, how do I dissect that into this one episode? And today is the day. So Prashant, how are you? And thanks for coming to the show. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Giris. And it's wonderful to be here in Back to Basics. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again. So before we get into the basics of uh, Web3, blockchain and technology, innovation and everything else that we're going to talk about, what does uh, Back to Basic mean to you? Uh, for me, Back to Basics is uh, two things. One is be satisfied with whatever you have, be happy with that and be hungry for whatever is coming next and what you can achieve. Uh, that's pretty much what I apply to every part of my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Prashant, for coming here. And thank you for answering that question. So before we dissect uh, the whole episode here, first of all, let's talk about blockchain. What does blockchain mean to you? So blockchain is like, in a simple terms, it's a digital ledger. Like in a, in a classic world, you have a ledger for various things, for stock, for accounting, for various transactions and so on. Now, once the ledger is written, you cannot modify, you can only add to it. You can't remove the existing information. Uh, blockchain is simply a digital version of that. So mm -hmm. what that means is that in a traditional way, ledger was controlled by a central entity mm -hmm. and they were kept in book by those middlemen. Now, mm -hmm. with the technology, we can achieve digital um, clone of that. And what that means is that nobody, not an individual party host or owns that particular infrastructure. That means the contract is agreed between multiple parties, mm -hmm. uh, executed, and then it cannot be modified unless all the parties agree and uh, like, you know, add to it. And that brings the whole middleman network to the technology world and then you can rely on technology for an inherent trust which has been middlemen in in the past yeah 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 thank you thank you again i, I think the words that we're looking at is centralized and decentralized is that the correct yes, word true. Okay, yes. so we'll get into we'll get into that and then what does web3 uh, mean to you so now because you have this digital infrastructure which mm. can provide that inherent trust and the ownership you can then take the whole traditional web and then put on top of this infrastructure and that makes it web3 in a, in a very simple terms although it's a very complex and vast um, subject but in um, in one sentence if you want to like you know understand web3 it allows data to be an asset that you can own you can transact and you can invest in that's mm -hmm. what the key purpose of Web3 is transparency and the data is actually seen by everyone. So today, if you go to Google or Facebook, you are giving data, but you have no visibility across what happens to that data afterwards. Hmm. When, web, when you put those platforms on Web3, you can see the entire chain, how your data was collected, used, utilized, um, incentivized, and like, you know, do uh, like the monetary gain was made. And that, in fact, also gives back that you as an owner of that data should re be rewarded for that data as well, not just the people who are collecting it. Mm -hmm. And that's the main difference between Web 2 and Web 3. Everything else is just implementation and like how you can achieve in various forms, various applied mm -hmm. layers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And I was going to go and ask you, uh, but we were able to see this before, right? When it when it comes yeah. to the data transfers and receiving the the, the packets and all that. Yeah. But how is that different than yesterday and today? It's, it's a difference if the infrastructure is no longer owned by the central entities. It's decentralized. Mm. So it's a public record. It's, uh, it's becoming a public and a decentralized record that not a single entity owns. And that means not a one person has control or 
like you know uh, behind the scene what they do with the data you mm. cannot hide it that's the whole purpose uh, yeah. of course there are security layers and everything that prevents from like you know identity uh, theft and privacy and all that but in general if someone to go and uh, someone that what happened to my data i want to find out they can follow that chain and find out exactly where that data was used utilized um, accessed and so on okay okay Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you again uh, for that. Now, when it comes to Web3 and blockchain, are they side by side or is it on top of each other? Can you explain they're, they're, how the design is working on that? They're complementary. So blockchain is the basic technology that gives the database structure, data structure to enable all this transparency. And then mm. web, web is using that and decentralizing the whole in infrastructure. Got it. which basically uses the blockchain as, as an underneath technology. So they are complementing or intertwined technologies. Okay. Thank, thank you again. Uh, from the technology world, I understand uh, people will understand about the blockchain and the Web3 and how it gets you know, secured and something like that. But let me ask you this from a consumer point of view. Yes. What, what is a consumer going to be seeing? Do they see um, different? They, they will they will see a lot of difference in terms of one, and I hope it achieves to its promise, is the increase in transparency. Okay. Um, given uh, all the all the different areas, like you go to finance, in a typical world, you cannot see what banks are doing with your money behind the scene. When it comes to blockchain, you should have that visibility um, of your money, that where it is used, how it is used, who owns that, how the return were, uh, calculated how that were passed, how much of that was passed back to the consumer. So uh, the transparency is the key aspect as a consumer should be looking for and should be expecting out of this new uh, paradigm of technology. Mm. Uh, Web3, same thing. Uh, you have your data, you have your transaction, you have been so play to earn uh, and various platforms that are coming through. What they are saying is that by being part of that network, you as a consumer are incentivized as well so mm -hmm. platforms coming like if you watch like you you watch youtube we all watch youtube like almost 30 percent of our internet time which is surprising but mm -hmm. then we all do it right mm -hmm. and those 30 percent we probably watch like you know 10 15 ads a day but there's mm -hmm. no reward coming back to us mm -hmm. now in web3 the platforms are coming which basically rewards you so you might be saying oh if, if i watch like you know 60 ads per month pay for my netflix subscription or whatever yeah. right so yeah. that whole mechanism of giving back to consumer is the is the main application that consumer would be noticing first mm -hmm. thank, thank you again for that but all this data was already there before yes As difference between before and now is now it's kind of real time and automated. Is that the difference you think? It's, it's more transparent. I think that's the right way of putting that. That's the right um, way of putting it. Yeah. So uh, previously you still had the data. You didn't have the visibility and the control was centralized. Now by making it decentralized and transparent and visible to the public, you can see what is happening you can claim the ownership of the data and you can link the transaction that happens on that particular piece of information mm. from the start to finish so think of it in your classic farm uh, or a egg tech uh, perspective uh, you have you have your coffee beans and uh, you don't know where they were farmed they were farmed on multiple farms and bought together mm. packaged or anything like that mm. now when people are putting blockchain on top of that you can see which farm the beans were created in mm. which uh, middlemen actually which middlemen actually dealt with those beans to get to where you have on the mm. retailer side mm. and then coffee shop used it and they are in your used in your coffee mm. all right you can trace back all the way um, mm. now that same thing in, apply to anything that you can think of any digital piece of information mm. you want to go and trace back uh, be it like a health tech um, like a artificial organ is a classic case. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the medication that needs to be uh, produced in a particular way, stored in a particular way, transported in a particular way, and then need to be discarded after the expiry. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's not much problem in the first world country because the regulations are very strong. But you, when you go to uh, countries like India and China and all that, the counterfeit is a 
major problem in health tech now mm. imagine that when you take a like a drug that can either save you or kill you you can trace back that was that done properly if tomorrow there is an insurance claim they can go mm. and check if the process was followed exactly how they are supposed to be for that particular so right now it is done at the batch level at a manufacturer mm. level that this mm. batch was passed by qa and so mm. on mm. with the middleman but now it is coming back to the technology and your your digital infrastructure is able to validate for a very granular size of that like one box or one strip of your medicine you can trace back all the way to its manufacturing and mm -hmm. even before that now oh, thank you thank you for uh, for explaining that because uh, that is actually the key what you just explained and i was just going to go and ask you if there was a problem with the batch but i think you eliminated the uh, the batch part <laughs> So I totally get that now. So thank you again for explaining that. But you are keep on using the word centralized and decentralized. Can yes. you explain what does it mean between the two? And yes. then we'll just talk about that if sure. you don't. Yeah. So um, let's go to crypto, back to basics, like where the blockchain first uh, made the huge impact and it made the hype and what we are seeing today. So in a traditional world, your money is um, created by the government or a central entity. And then you rely, like if you have a $10 note, you are relying on the government to, for it to be authentic and for it to be uh, rewarded for whatever, like you can buy with $10, all right? Uh, so the trust is given by that central entity. Now, imagine that you do not have central entity, then there's no trust. Like if I give you a piece of paper and write $10 on it, it doesn't really mean anything because mm -hmm. There's no trust between you and me. Hmm. But now you create an infrastructure that all of us can trust that provides the transparency and say, if there is a $10 in that, then I promise and you can trace back that I promise you $10. And then tomorrow you can come back and say, look, you gave me $10. This is what happened. And now hmm. you need to, you are liable for that $10. All right. Hmm. So you have that trust built into the system that's what decentralization does that mm -hmm. rather than having a central entity to provide the trust you have these multiple nodes that are always up to date and can verify that identity and provide that trust as a, as a technology hmm. thank you again from the you know the examples that you've given before from a consumer side i think they understand that can you tell from a consumer example when it comes to centralized and decentralized? Um, think about um, one of my friends, Stephen Moss. He explained it very uh, nicely in my one of uh, the podcasts I was in. Think of it as a spider web. And it has these nodes, uh, different nodes. And as something passes through this web, every node is able to see that particular piece of information and is able to verify that that's an authentic piece of information and it has to go through all those nodes before it is marked as the valid information hmm. so you are that's in a in a very basic term that's decentralization hmm. thank you thank you again but i thought we were already doing that right from the bank's point of view let's say if you go to an atm and you take money out Hmm. Isn't that also decentralized and centralized situation? It, it is not in a real sense because let's say if you if you get a money from bank, the bank verifies with like, you know, with the actual authority. So the banks are central authority. But let's say you, you eradicate the whole banking network. There's no there's no central entity that says like banks are still tied to central entity of like Reserve Bank or like, you know, whatever the entity that gives money and mm. they are registered with that and they are going back and saying look the, this bank is allowed this much money mm. they have to have security and all that they have to do it as like you know the ledger has to be like checked against each other uh, every day and then uh, there are middlemen like you know that are saying yes that bank is audited and so on that audit part is a, from in a finance world that audit is a costly exercise because mm -hmm. Um, you have to. You, you do not have trust in the entity. You ha mm. you have to verify the paperwork to say whether those paperwork are valid or those transactions are valid. And those transactions, until they are open for audit, are owned by that central entity. So, if for mm. example, you go to like a whatever bank, uh, central bank, or anyone, and they have the infrastructure where they are storing information, nobody can go and challenge that or open up that unless. Mm 
supply, the infrastructure of that info message is owned by that bank. Mm. In a decentralized world, that is not the case. Mm. They can, they, uh, the entity who are providing, the exchanges who are providing, they are open. Someone can go and check the exchange, what is happening with a particular piece of money. Of course, for the privacy reason, you cannot directly tie it back to the user unless there's a court order or something. But if you, uh, if you got a ten dollar note in a crypto world, ten Bitcoin, you can go back and say where those ten Bitcoin came from, like mm. various nodes, mm. all the transaction from the first time it was actually minted. Mm. You cannot do that in a in a central world unless, like you know, you you have um, it, it's virtually impossible because that that liquidity is not traced back. Because I think you need a subpoena in order to get that information. Is that right? Not just not just subpoena. That information is lost at some point. Like if oh. you, if I take money out of my bank account as a cash and then use it somewhere, and then um, uh, once that converted into cash and then put back into the other system, now you have a gap that is never gotcha. known. What Got happened? Where that cash come from? Or uh, if one bank has a transaction and another bank has. When money is transferred from one bank to another, there is an information gap because now you have two systems that are owned by two central entity, which Got do it. not, we which do not have transparency between them or or able to like you know some third party can go and see. Whereas in exchange, you can see everything. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. So thank you, thank you again for explaining that to to all the folks who are listening uh, on this uh, show today. Yeah. You know, uh, Prashant. Uh, Thank you again for answering that question. Now, there are two words which I think I might pronounce it incorrectly. I think it's going to say uh, data monarch and data uh, demographic. Uh, demographic. Yeah. Uh, so can you explain that if you don't mind the differences? Can you can you just say the first word again? Uh, monarch. Monarchy. Monarch. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what what is the data monarch if you don't uh, mind explaining data monarchy is simply a central entity having a possession of a large amount of data you know um, literally a monopoly on that so google and facebook going back to that google owns like the largest data in the world at the moment and nobody can like really do anything with it or transparency there's nothing like they are literally a monarchy on on top of those data this mm. like you know a couple of companies across the world they have all the world's data and that's it nobody else has any right or accessibility or transparency across that so by decentralizing it you are breaking it you are breaking that monarchy and going into a digital democracy so to say where everybody has access to information transparency of that information and hopefully the reward of providing that information. Yeah, thank, thank you again. For so all, all the stuff that we've talked about and dissected one by one uh, mm -hmm. into, into the chain, let's say, right? Yep. Uh, now the question is from a business point and a consumer point, what do we need to do to upgrade or does it upgrade on its own? And we just need to wait now, and watch. So like many basic technologies that goes at a very basic level, like internet. A um, lot of companies actually migrated to internet uh, proactively, but then there were a lot of things that just born in the internet. They were like post um, internet uh, products, systems, and so on. And in other sense, consumer didn't really choose the migration. They just, they were provided by the systems they were using. Mm. So. I, Lot of banks are now uh, already like you know in Australia, you know, in uh, introduced stable coin, uh, which is like a bank currency backed by the AUD. So you can buy digital currency from the bank. So uh, and in the banking world, uh, if you go in the history, previously the government didn't have mint or reserve bank or anything. The mm. banks were given contract to mint the money. Mm. And this is similar to that, that banks are giving their digital currency, which is of, of course tied to like AUD or something, but you don't need to mint it. So it's a digitally native currency. Mm. Uh, and what happens with that uh, is um, like when you, when you have a various entity doing that in a digital world, it mm. becomes a digital native. So 
people might say okay they didn't start using digital banking out of blue or they didn't some of the people they didn't proactively do it but by using credit card they were used already started to use it by using atm card they were already in that digital world mm. so when the infrastructure changes a lot of that happens uh, at the like ground level at the infrastructure level and people just start using different means of accessing it without realizing that it's a completely new infrastructure yeah yeah thank you thank you again so let's take a, an example of a credit card okay mm -hmm. so before we used to swipe the credit card and charge yes now we are putting the chip in there or we're tapping yeah do you think that's a step-by-step -step process in order to change the the algorithm i mean uh, i mean it's just the way transaction is done but underneath it's just money transferred from one entity to other that's simple as that and uh, if you go to like um, india or something that took the digital economy, digital uh, payment much later. They even have advanced systems. So UPI, for example, in India, which is very common, like if you want to recharge your phone, all you have to do is like on your mobile, you have to like the device that you have already uh, pre-authenticated, you get a code and that code you need to provide someone to get the money. Simple, you don't need cheap or anything like that. So I, those UPI and stuff, it's just a different way of translating, but the idea is same with the, uh, a entity is authorizing that I'm giving money and someone is receiving. Uh, Prashant, I, I think there's some audio issues. Um, are you hearing? Can I hear you now? I can hear. I can hear it fine. Okay, because you're coming out bad on on your side. Okay, uh, which part did you miss? <laughs> Just the beginning part of the credit card. Okay, that's all right. Um, what I was saying is that the the transfer of money is happening in a various ways now obviously it's running the card tapping the card all of that tapping the phone is one way of doing that uh, also like you know we're transferring to someone's mobile number or something am i still uh no it was coming out bad give me a second One. Okay, I can hear you now. All right, all good. All good. So let's start again. <laughs> from, right. uh, it's okay. question, so the question was: Let, let me first start from there. Mm -hmm. When we use a credit card, we swipe the card, we tap the card, we put the chip with there. Uh, does that mean that we're already in transition on on the new technology? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Digital, digital payment has been around for a long time and it doesn't really change much when you go to blockchain or anything except that now instead of owning a card or a bank account, you own a key to the, to the money that you have. Uh, and then by using that key and owning that in your wallet, you can transfer between the wallets. So the transfer is still very similar from one wallet to another. Uh, storing is very similar to the traditional way. Uh, the difference that is um, most people are getting still getting used to is how do they store the key and how do they not lose the key, which is a major problem. And that is solved by a lot of custodian uh, wallets or like digital backups that they back, back up on Google Drive or Vault or anything like that. And that way you, you don't have to manage those keys and uh, you don't have to like basically be afraid that if you lose the key, you will lose everything. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Prashant, for uh, explaining that. Uh, you know, before you leave today, can you uh, explain what company you work for? Why did I call you here? Because you have so much of knowledge, which people don't even know, uh, you know, and uh, and I'll keep on tapping you on, on your knowledge base. So can you explain to people who you are, if you don't mind? Sorry. So I run a company called X Enabler. So X Enabler is basically a technology innovation company focusing on blockchain and Web3. So we basically, if, if there is a business who want to do something in blockchain or they are creating a project in blockchain, Web3 metaverse, then we provide the end-to-end -end, uh, consultation and development service. So we do discovery workshop with them asking like, you know, what they are trying to do, what are the business goals, and then explaining them what are the different technologies, how they can be used to achieve that goal. Um, like, Because a lot of the time people think, oh, 
we want to do crypto, but what they are actually saying in the business term is actually an NFT and a crypto joint network kind of thing. Or they say, oh, we want to go to metaverse. But what they are actually asking is a virtual reality on a basic level, not completely in metaverse. So that part is important because the businesses have a very business minded goal. And as a technology, we need to use technology as a tool and answer those questions to how they can achieve that and then actually implement that mm. implement those projects in creating exchanges creating metaverse entities creating nfts and so on yeah yeah thank you thank you again but i think uh, and thank you prashant for for coming on the show too uh, one quick thing all the stuff that we have talked about okay everything yeah. that we have talked about I think there's one thing that people are still scared of, which is security. Yes. So what do you think? Do you think that we should be concerned about the security? I guess we should be. But what do we need to do to make ourselves safe? I think with any new thing, not just technology, new town, new neighborhood, new people, anything, uh, do your homework. You don't need to be technology expert. Nobody needs to do that. But the entities you are dealing with, are they authentic? Do they have the like you know framework in place? Are they like you know digitally certified by the government or the entities that you trust in? And like you know, do your homework and then go ahead or, or find someone who actually understands and like you know get get information, get verified by them. Uh, that's all always works uh, in a new town or anything. We ask for referees. We ask for people we know that, hey, I'm going to this neighborhood. Should I buy a house in this neighborhood or not? It, same goes for your investment. Should I invest in this particular scheme or not? And that's best we can do. Yes, I do understand and I see that every new thing brings all sort of things, good and bad. And there is some collateral that going to happen. Um, mm. I don't think... Uh, learning can happen without that, but at the end of the day, uh, we evolve, and that's a human history, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you again, Prashant. And one last question, if you don't mind. The last question is: uh, there actually is a statement. Are we ready to lose control and give up all the control? And it's not always about me. It's I guess it's mm -hmm. about everyone who's controlling me. Does that make we, sense? We never are, are we? Like whenever something new comes we uh, it goes through a typical cycle of like you know amazing us scaring us adapting it and then trusting it so every piece of new technology or new thing that comes through has to go through that there's no other way to penetrate the human society so uh, and and this technology i think is at a point where we we were like really scared if i go a couple of years back now we are slowly approaching the trusting phase i believe because i see a lot of uh, conversations that are more about okay so how does it work how can i use it rather than oh should i stay away from it the mm -hmm. question has changed and that can give me a feeling that we are slowly going into trusting and understanding more yeah 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 thank you thank you again prashant for for answering all those questions and and crazy questions i hope i didn't really stress you out but thank you no. again for coming on the show and uh, making this brighter for me but before you leave do you have any last words to all my listeners and viewers and how was your uh, journey on uh, back to basics too no this is great actually this is a very different conversation to what i have had before which were very technical in many cases um so no i really enjoyed being here i think the show lives up to its name, Back to Basics, um, and that is a really good thing. Um, so I really enjoyed this. And what, if one thing I can tell to people about like technology in general, not just blockchain or anything, is that the change is coming. So better ride it rather than fight it, all right? Mm -hmm. Make it your own, like what actually makes sense to you, what doesn't make sense to you, and navigate your own way rather than saying, I'll, I'll stay away from it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Prashant, for coming on the show. And uh, uh, definitely an honor for you to be here. And that, uh, my honor, actually. So thank you again for, for coming here. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. So guys, we spoke with Prashant today and we talked about the innovation of the world, isn't it? And we talked about Web3. We talked about blockchain. We talked about centralized, decentralized, all the fun stuff that we talked about. And the main thing that we talked about is it's already here. 
we don't have to be scared. The only thing that we, we are trying to do is to make awareness. And we're going to the in-depth knowledge of this episode. Now, as usual, as always, there is a quote of the day from Back to Basics, and hopefully Prashant will like uh, the quote. And the quote is, the only way to discover the limits of the in- of the possible is to go beyond them into impossible. Now, if you think about it, we never really thought about that we were going to do this, were we? So we made that impossible to a possible port, right? And that's all we're trying to do. Keep on learning and relearning and unlearning. I think that's what we're trying to do here. Now, as usual, as always, what do we always do? Everything in life goes back to basics, and that's what we did today, guys. Guys, take care. God bless. Keep on commenting on all my episodes because it makes me stronger day by day, week by week because I am releasing every day to help you out and give you awareness on Back to Basics. And the three things, including this episode, makes it a hit, according to me, that is, which is the content, the guest, and definitely the host. Guys, take care. God bless. And I will see you next time on Back to Basics. Take care. God bless. Next week's episode on Back to Basics. But I think solo means, generally speaking, you have your hand in making the product. Hmm. Generally speaking, you even have your hand probably in selling the product. So hmm. you're a bit closer to it than maybe the larger small business. They may not be making the product at all. They're hmm. kind of, you know, some people are making it in the factory as it were. Maybe they're only managing. So is that helpful? Again, the entrepreneur, often they want to scale it bigger. The hmm. small business owner, uh, it's them and, and a team of people. And the solo business owner, for sure, they're kind hmm. of closer to that freelancer, as hmm. Seth Godin talks about. But solo is a hybrid because they may not be quite freelancer. Hmm.